Over the past few decades, there's been an explosion in the use of game theory tools to analyze oligopolistic markets. Some of the results are really interesting, and some are really complicated, way beyond the AP test, or even what I can understand. But a couple of general lessons have emerged from these interesting, complicated findings. One is that oligopoly markets tend to yield an outcome in between the outcomes of perfect competition and monopoly. Consider prices. Unlike perfect competition, oligopolistic firms aren't just price takers, so they can exert some market power and set prices above marginal cost. But they can't fully exert the market power of monopolies because they have to worry about other firms in their industry. So prices above marginal cost, and therefore higher than with perfect competition, but below the monopoly level where there's no competition. Since prices above marginal cost, the firm is making profits. Once again, not as much profits as a monopolist, but more than the zero profit of a firm in a perfectly competitive market. Now think about quantities. Remember that regardless of the market structure, firms must respect the demand curve. So if prices are higher than those in perfect competition, quantities sold will be lower than in perfect competition. And if prices are lower than in monopoly, quantities sold will be higher than monopoly. Now let's turn to welfare. We know that a perfectly competitive firm maximizes welfare. And we know the monopolist causes deadweight loss by foregoing trade through willingness to pay its above marginal cost. An oligopoly also causes deadweight loss. Since its price is above marginal cost, trades that make both parties better off aren't happening. However, since its prices aren't as far above marginal cost as the monopolist, its deadweight loss is lower. The second interesting lesson that's emerged is that oligopoly firms do have one tool to try to escape for the competitive pressures that they face, product differentiation. We've seen before how market power is driven by inelastic demand. The more consumers can substitute away from a firm's product, the less profit the firm makes. So how do firms make it harder for people to substitute away from their products? How do they make demand more inelastic? By making their products more unique. It's tough to substitute away from goods that are more unique. There just aren't many, or even any, good substitutes. This is a fundamental force driving the creation of new products, an effort to make profits by reducing the substitutability of your good for others. A great example is one you may have had for breakfast this morning, Apple Cinnamon Cheerios. Cheerios have been around for a long time. General Mills introduced them during World War II. Back then, Cheerios didn't have much competition in the breakfast cereal market. It was Cheerios, Corn Flakes, Quaker Oats, and not much else. But after a while, many more brands entered the market. By 1970, Americans had over 150 breakfast cereals to choose from. Consumers began to see Cheerios as being highly substitutable with other alternatives. Many of these other cereals out there were also made of pulverized oats and didn't taste all that different from Cheerios. So in 1989, General Mills introduced Apple Cinnamon Cheerios a differentiated product for which there weren't as good substitutes. If consumers wanted the taste and texture of the new brand of Apple Cinnamon Cheerios, they had to buy from General Mills. A lack of good substitutes meant that the demand for Apple Cinnamon Cheerios was more inelastic than the demand for the more ordinary, substitutable, regular Cheerios. And more inelastic demand gave General Mills more market power to set an even higher price. We know that in markets where price is above marginal cost, there's more deadweight loss, higher profits to producers, and less consumer surplus. So is the introduction of Apple Cinnamon Cheerios bad news for consumers? Not at all. Sure, General Mills made some profit off the new differentiated cereal, but consumers also now had a new product that provided value to them. Jerry Hausman, a colleague of mine at MIT, estimated that the introduction of Apple Cinnamon Cheerios increased consumer surplus by over $75 million per year in the US. That's not bad for a single new brand of cereal. It's especially impressive considering that consumers already had regular Cheerios and Honey Nut Cheerios as options when this new brand was released in 1989. Most product innovation in the market is driven by the efforts of oligopolistic competitors to differentiate their products to make money. Today, even though 90% of the breakfast cereal market is controlled by only five firms, there are, only, there are over 5,000 brands of cereal to choose from. That's a lot of product differentiation. This highlights the fundamental tension of markets with imperfect competition. 
On the one hand, the prospects of profit are what drives firms to innovate and create the goods consumers want to buy. On the other hand, once these goods do exist, a firm and oligopoly competing only against a few other firms can exert its market power. Relative to the perfect competition equilibrium, the firm sets the price too high and the production level too low. So is this good or bad for welfare? Ultimately, it depends on how viable the product differentiation is. If this is a valuable new product, then the gains from the product existing may exceed the cost of an imperfect market. But less competition for products that are fundamentally similar can be bad for social welfare.